Hey, paper callers, let's start to put everything we've learned together and talk about actually building your business. So I'm going to cover what I believe to be the easiest path to success in paper call. And this does not mean you have to follow it exactly. You need to do what's right for you. There's all sorts of other things that you can do. This is just my thought process on how to go from start to finish, maybe over the period of a year to actually build your own paper call business. Now, first and foremost, whenever I personally have moved into any industry, I start as an affiliate so that I can understand how that industry operates. And so my suggestion is if you're new to paper call to start by driving calls into networks as an affiliate using online advertising. That's going to be your easiest and fastest route to potential success. And it's going to open up a lot of doors and get you started into understanding all the concepts that you're going to need to be successful in this space. Now, working with networks is also going to teach you a whole bunch of lessons on what not to do and what to look out for as well. And so you can start to build up your treasure chest of failures and use them to define your roadmap to figure out where you're going to take your business. And so, like I said before, this map isn't fixed. You should always be thinking about where you're going to go and then react to what you actually learn. Now, once you get started driving calls, you need to create multiple network relationships and then load balance those calls among multiple networks or multiple buyers if you're able to find some direct buyers. Now, you need third party tracking software to do this. And I absolutely recommend that you use third party tracking software. Most affiliates that are not using third party tracking software are never going to get beyond maybe $100, $200 a day in revenue because they have no control and no visibility over their traffic. Now there are a couple other courses out there that talk about pay per call and they very briefly gloss over third party tracking and say you don't really need it as an affiliate because networks have their own platforms and that is just absolute bullshit. And so if you don't, if you actually plan to build a business in pay per call, get your own third party tracking, whether it's Ringba or not, otherwise you're going to have a much harder time moving forward in this business. Now, once you have some traffic moving and you're working with multiple networks and buyers to load balance your calls, you need to go find direct call center buyers, direct buyers as soon as humanly possible. That's because networks are essentially just brokers and they're taking a cut and they've done all the business development work for you. So it's easy to get started. But once you already have some traffic that you can use as negotiating power, you need to cut them out as soon as possible uh, or uh, move them down your routing plan so that they're not prioritized. Now, I don't think you should cannibalize your network relationships. That would not be smart. But as soon as you bring on some direct buyers that are paying you more money, you simply deprioritize the networks in your tracking software so that they still receive calls if you don't have capacity available at your direct buyers, but you're optimized to get as much money as call, uh, per call as possible. And so next I would then reduce my dependence on networks until they're only my backup, okay? And so I would find more direct buyers. Uh, I would find as many call centers as I possibly could to take that traffic and then only send calls to networks as a last resort. They're great for grabbing up the traffic, uh, or if they have exclusive campaigns, I love that, right? If a network has an agency of record and is the exclusive on a campaign, that's fine because you can't get it anywhere else. That then is real value. But if it's just a brokered campaign and the network does not have the exclusive on it, I'm just going to go ahead and do everything I possibly can to cut them out so that I can get those higher payouts and then bid more for my traffic. Okay, and networks may not like this advice, but I encourage networks to work harder to get exclusive campaigns and actually provide something that people can't get elsewhere. That's really how a network builds their competitive advantage. Um, and so I, I just highly advise them to go do more of that because then their affiliates can't go anywhere else. Now, once I've 
removed my dependence on networks. They're my backup. I have a bunch of direct buyers in place. I'm gonna run the same game and I'm gonna try and cut out the direct buyers as well and go create my own network of self-serve buyers and that way I become vertically integrated. If I'm generating the phone call and selling to a small insurance agency and then routing calls to hundreds of micro buyers, all right, I'm gonna get the highest margin per phone call I possibly can and then I'm gonna create enterprise value so that I can eventually sell my company. And so that's my personal game plan. This is also the most amount of work you could ever do in pay per call. And so if you wanna, you know, not really do constant seven day a week hustle, uh, building your own self-serve buyer network may not be in the cards for you, right? But I love working because I know I can work harder than everybody else. And so that's just a prerequisite for how I do business. You're just gonna have to decide how you wanna do it. And then next, once I start building my own self-serve buyer networks, I'm gonna create my own brand, right? Like 1-800-DENTIST or whatever it is so that all my calls flow through my brand and I create uh, something of value that people can remember. And then my network of buyers buy out all those calls, but realistically people are coming to me to do their comparison shopping. And so those assets outside of the buyer network also generate enterprise value and are the key to long-term business success. It's also something that takes a lot of work, right? And so if you're gonna do this model of self-serve buyer network plus your own assets or brands, you're gonna be doing a lot of work, you're gonna be building a team, you're gonna be building uh, properties on the internet, you're gonna have to develop your own websites, you're gonna be doing SEO, you're gonna be doing content creation, you're gonna be doing a lot of fucking work, okay? And then once I have those assets and brands, that's when I'm gonna do TV, uh, radio, and out-of-home advertising in certain markets to brand those campaigns and really get into people's heads. And then once I have my own brand and my own uh, assets to promote and I understand the markets and then I really have a handle on the verticals that I'm operating in, you know, maybe I've selected three or five verticals that I'm gonna focus on that are all sort of in the same family so that I can upsell to different people. I'm gonna bring on affiliates of my own so that we don't have to do all of the work on the traffic generation side uh, and we can take advantage of uh, all the pricing data we have to work with affiliates. So affiliates are really smart, they're very clever. If I know that my team can generate a phone call for $10, I'm gonna pay affiliates eight and see what they can come up with, right? I'm gonna get my cost of acquisition down while opening up an opportunity to scale and an opportunity for an affiliate to build a business, right? And so I'm gonna provide the same opportunity that I effectively started with in step one. And then, depending on your goals, you also have the opportunity to open up a network at this point. You have your self-serve buyer network, you have a bunch of direct buyers, maybe at this point you've negotiated some exclusives of your own, um, and then you can kind of open that up in the network business model. Though I would say that the network business model is a grueling model, you're essentially just a broker, so if you have not created some type of competitive advantage like your own properties, your own brands, um, agency of record or exclusive back-end buyers that you're gonna have a rough go uh, as a network and you're not necessarily adding a whole bunch of value, you're just trying to skim value off the top by connecting people. Now as you build your business and you know everybody in the space and you understand where everyone fits in uh, and all the hundreds or thousands of players and connections that you can make over the period of years, then it may be very is easy to start connecting those people blindly in a network model and it's something for you to consider. Though there's a whole bunch of risk associated with that and um, if I were doing this, I probably wouldn't open up a network of my own. I would just secure exclusive deals and build my own buyer network so that people have to come to me if they wanna promote my offers. And so that's a little bit different than a network model. It's essentially vertically integrating the entire business and controlling it. So let's rewind to the beginning. If you're an affiliate, you really need to set up an LLC or a corporation, all right? And you basically need to do this to shield yourself 
of personal liability and to uh, mitigate your tax liability, optimize your taxes, okay? And there's a reason people always complain that rich people use corporations so they don't have to pay taxes. Well, that's how the system works and you need to understand how it works so that you can also minimize your tax liability and legal liability for whatever you're doing. Now I'd like to preface that I am not a lawyer and so if you have questions about this, you need to contact a lawyer or an accountant to figure out exactly what you want to do, okay? But I would highly recommend that if you're new and you don't have any experience uh, and you're a single affiliate and you don't have a team, that you can just go out and open one of these things on the internet on the actual state's website. You don't necessarily need to pay someone to do this. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, you can use LegalZoom and it, it's really cheap, okay? And so realistically speaking for a Wyoming company, I think it's like $150 with a resident agent to open up your own corporation, okay? And uh, the reason I suggest these three states are uh, real simple, Wyoming, uh, has no state income tax for corporations. They don't have any filing requirements, so you really only need to worry about your federal taxes. Uh, they also allow nominee signers, which is uh, one of the last bastions of anonymity in the United States when it comes to corporations. Um, Nevada, same thing, no corporate income tax, really easy to set up, not a lot of filing requirements. It's just super, super easy. You can get a registered agent. Um, so you don't actually need to live in these places to open up companies there. And then last on the list is Delaware. They have really low corporate taxes, but there's been so many major companies that have incorporated in Delaware. They have a lot of case law that's established. And what I mean by that is they've had a lot of corporate lawsuits. Uh, and so they have a lot of rules in place and there's not a lot of wiggle room. So it's very easy to follow those rules and that's why public companies and a lot of big companies incorporate there. So realistically speaking, you only need to go to the state of Wyoming or state of Nevada's website, open up your company, use a registered agent, then you have a business, you have an address you can use for your email or whatever, um, and you can take money into a corporate account then so you can file corporate income tax and write off a lot of the expenses for your company, like your advertising and your legal services, your accounting and whatever, okay? And so again, you're only about 150 bucks in if you do this yourself. I've done this in all three states myself. It's not a complicated process. It actually only takes a few minutes and you can literally be set up uh, in a couple minutes. If you don't wanna go through the state's website and you really need a registered agent, just uh, Google uh, Wyoming or Nevada registered agents and those people can set up companies for you rather cheaply too. Like this is a super cheap process. You don't need a lawyer to do it. Um, but if you want to learn about this process, call a lawyer. They'll usually give you a free consultation and you can just find out what their services are and they'll give you some pointers and tips to try and sell you on them and you can learn just by calling them, okay? I would be respectful of people's time. I wouldn't call like 30 lawyers to try and get someone to give you more information. It's really not that complicated. If you want, you can call one. Uh, but realistically, you should establish a, a lawyer relationship at some point so that you have someone you can talk to when you need it. But that's gonna require a retainer. You're gonna have to send them some money. Um, you may not be ready for that, okay? So once you have your company established, you're gonna to go to the IRS website and get an EIN online. And that's an employment identification number. And you need that to open a bank account, to run payroll, to do anything, to file your taxes, uh, whatever, right? And so as soon as you get your company, just go online and get your EIN. Now that's not a complicated process. If you say that you're an advertising consultant, okay, they don't ask any other questions, you can download your EIN online. All right, uh, let's just make sure that an affiliate is advertising consulting effectively. So if you're gonna do anything else, you need to classify it properly, but there's a step-by-step process that you follow on their website. It is super easy. You get a PDF in your EIN and you're good to go. Now you're gonna print out your articles of incorporation. You're gonna print out your EIN using actual paper, okay? And then you're gonna go to a bank. 
That can be Chase, Wells Fargo, whatever. Make sure you go to a bank that's a major national brand. Not one of these tiny regional credit unions, all right, because a lot of these tiny regional credit unions don't have a SWIFT code. And that means you can't accept a wire transfer from an international bank. And I've actually seen this before where people in the affiliate space use the local credit union because it's convenient and cheap, but then they can't accept wire transfers from around the world. And so you can't go work with paper call networks that are located outside the United States it becomes a giant pain in the ass, all right? And so most banks don't charge fees, all right? If you go into a chase and they say there's fees, tell them that Wells Fargo doesn't have any and ask them to waive them. They'll just waive them, okay? So there's essentially no fees for a business checking account anywhere. You're not gonna get, uh, you're not gonna get any interest, so don't worry about that. Uh, you just basically need an operating account so you can receive payments, pay your bills, um, and run your business. So after you get open the bank account, at the same time, get a corporate debit card, all right? And this corporate debit card is for buying traffic or buying domain names or whatever you're gonna use the company for, all right? Now, a big, big, big important word of advice here is keep your personal and corporate expenses separate. And so that means if it can't be classified as a corporate expense, and I will note I'm not an accountant, you should talk to one, don't use your corporate debit card for it, all right? Keep your personal life and your business life separate. A lot of new business people make this mistake. They intermingle everything and then they're unable to keep track of what they're doing, what their liabilities are, what their profit and loss is, all that good stuff, all right? And so with an affiliate business, it's really simple. Spend less money than you make, okay? And so you wanna run a cash business, a cash accounting business. That means that money in minus money out is your profit, all right? and you can run some expenses in there, of course, corporate ones, but do not run all your personal expenses through there, otherwise you can't keep track of everything, all right? Find a cheap accountant, all right? Accountants are not a big deal, they're not that expensive, you're gonna want one. If you're brand new and you're just starting out, you don't need to talk to one immediately, but you probably should talk to one pretty soon, especially if you're gonna open a corporation because you have a limited amount of time uh, to decide whether it's gonna be a C-Corp or an S-Corp. I'm not gonna dive into that. You need to talk to uh, your accountants about that. Or if you wanna keep everything just super easy, you can go LLC and it's very easy to file your taxes at the end of the year because it goes under your personal taxes uh, and you can just use TurboTax or something, all right? As always with lawyers and accountants, comparison shop them, all right? Maybe that doesn't seem like something you would do. I know a lot of people don't do it, but it's the same as going to Amazon and comparison shopping, anything. Uh, you need to go and call a bunch of these people and find the ones that, one, you seem to like, two, that have great reviews, and three, have low rates. It's that simple, all right? Cheap and easy for good legal advice and good accounting advice is actually possible, all right? So don't overpay. Don't worry about brands, just find people that seem intelligent and are easy to work with. And so next, I wanna talk about why affiliates fail, okay? Uh, I've been in the industry a long time, my entire professional career, it's over like 15 years at this point. And so I've seen a lot of affiliates fail and I've been party to some of these things. You know, we all make mistakes, all right? But you need to grow up effectively, all right? Most Affiliates are in and out within six months. And that means affiliates that make a bunch of money too, all right? And so my litmus test is at Affiliate Summit, if I meet an affiliate that has one hell of an ego, we'll find out if they're there next year. And most of them are not because it's like a six month revolving door. Affiliates will find one campaign that works and they'll make a little bit of money, they'll spend all of it, right? and then they don't show up again. And so this is why I love this picture, all right? Because it's true, all right? The broke billionaire, right? Like the affiliate that's all dressed in Louis and Gucci and covered in diamonds and whatever, uh, and talking about all the money they have, probably is not doing nearly as well as they seem. 
because it's clear at that point that they don't have financial discipline. Whereas billionaires, you just see them in t-shirts and jeans and whatever, right? Because they don't care, none of that matters. And so don't worry about those things. You need, in business, you need to not worry about your personal material items. You need to worry about financial discipline so that you can grow your business. It's much easier to grow a business if you have a giant pile of cash than it is to grow your business if you have a bunch of bling and no cash, right? Because if you need to hire someone or you have a campaign turn and it's no longer profitable or you lose a bunch of money testing, well, it's really hard to pay Google with Gucci sunglasses. They only take cash, all right? So please, just save as much money as you possibly can. If you find some wins and you start making what you consider a lot of money, keep it, invest it, save it for your future. Do not go spend it on bottle service and bullshit. Please, 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 okay? I've seen hundreds, maybe even a thousand affiliates make this exact mistake and they're, they lose their opportunity to build a business because they blew all their cash, all right? Now, once you get started, you need to build credit. If you have no credit or some credit or you ruined your credit, I don't care, okay? If you need credit repair, let me know. I know some great guys out in Jersey that'll help you out, but you need to build your credit, okay? And the first thing you need to do to do that is to get an American Express card, all right? Or a Chase Inc. card, these are great. And the reason I suggest these cards is because you get points, all right? You get points that you can then spend on airfare, hotel rooms, whatever, so that you can go to trade shows much easier. Now, the beautiful thing about American Express and a credit card is that when you're buying media, you can accrue a shitload of points very, very quickly, all right? Now, for instance, my business partner, Harrison, was the youngest guy ever to get American Express black card. He was like 12, okay? And he was able to accrue millions of points by buying media, and he's still spending those points today to buy plane tickets. And so it's absolutely crazy how many points you can actually accrue, and then those points can be used to go to trade shows, send your employees to trade shows, to build your business. Or if you wanna get the plum card, it gives cash back, which you can then invest again back into your business. This is all part of financial discipline, all right? And if you get that Amex or your ink, do not use it to buy things you don't need, only use it to pay your traffic bills or things that you know you can pay off, all right? Do not accrue a credit card balance that carries interest. You need to pay off 100% of your balance every month. And that's why I love American Express. It is a charge card for the most part, and that means you have to pay off your whole statement balance every month. You can't even run at a deficit, okay? And so if you're worried about credit, get the Amex and not the Inc, because the Inc is a credit card, okay? And the Amex is a charge card, so you have to pay it off so you can hold yourself accountable, all right? And these things are really, really, really important, all right? You're gonna need them, because if you find a campaign that works, and you need to scale it, and you can only run so much money over your corporate debit card because you, you, you don't have that much cash, well, you pay your Amex once a month, so you're essentially getting yourself credit that you can use to buy media and clicks, so you can scale your campaigns Without, need to get, without needing to get a loan, okay? And that's effectively what you're gonna do with it. You're gonna use it as credit to buy your traffic because networks and buyers may only pay you every two weeks or once a month, okay? And so it gives you the ability to buy all the traffic you need to grow your business. Now, you need to pay close attention to your statistics because if you're spending more money than you're making, you got a problem, you're still gonna have to pay off your Amex, all right? Now, a lot of affiliates also do not pick a specific vertical and focus their energy. They're trying to run a bunch of campaigns so they can figure out what one works, all right? I am a big proponent of becoming a master at something, which takes an immense amount of time and resource and focus. 
And so if I were going to get into paper call, I would pick a couple verticals that are uh, very similar to each other and have a similar audience. For instance, if I was going to do uh, medical supplement insurance, which is an older audience, I would pick, you know, other types of insurance like final expense insurance uh, and other types of campaigns that apply to older people so that I can reuse my audience over and over and over again and upsell them and monetize them on different things, okay? And so uh, you wanna pick complementary verticals and focus on it. Like if you're gonna do home services, there's a whole bunch of complementary ones. The type of marketing that you need to do to generate those calls is essentially similar. And so you can use the tactics you learn to grow a business in those complementary verticals, all right? Also, you need to invest in relationships and events. A lot of affiliates don't go to trade shows, they don't go to masterminds, they don't go to meetups, okay? And so you need to do that, you need to invest in yourself. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go give five or $10,000 out to some guru or go to some mastermind that's all hyped and promoted, okay? What I'm suggesting is you spend that money to go to trade shows and events so that you can meet the decision makers at all the companies you want to go and work with. Uh, also, I am a big fan of reaching out to people in various ways that isn't just over the internet and, and even showing up in person to create a relationship and that has a high cost to it, but most people don't do it. And so that's a great way that you can build a relationship. Now, if you're trying to work with a company that's located in Atlanta and you're in Seattle and you hit up that rep and say, hey, look, I'd love to come out to Atlanta, take you out to lunch, build a relationship, meet you in person so that we can grow a business together. They're gonna be very open to that because almost no one does it. And then when you meet them in person, you're essentially almost guaranteeing your ability to do business with them because the relationship's created. They're gonna take a risk on you simply because you put in the effort to go shake their hand and say hello. And a lot of people don't do this, but it is incredibly effective at growing a business because a lot of people don't do it. And so that's why these points are important. That's why saving your money is important. Sometimes you gotta just show up to make something happen and most people won't do it. And so it's a giant open door for you. Now, also, if you ask affiliates to send you their plan and their goals, they probably can't, right? Their plan's like, well, I just need to hustle some money. I'm gonna try and make some campaigns work, all right? That's not a plan, okay? A plan is I'm gonna test X, Y, and Z on Monday, X, Y, and Z on Tuesday. I'm gonna try and make these three campaigns work and I'm gonna dedicate my all to it over the next two weeks and then I'm gonna review the results and see if this is the uh, vertical I should be focusing on, all right? Follow your plan, put it in a timeline, okay? And then reassess. If your goal is to be a millionaire, that's a shitty goal. If your goal is to make a million dollars through pay per call by focusing on the finance verticals over the next 12 months, that's a much better goal because now you have a timeline, you have focus, you know what you're gonna do, and at the end of 12 months, if you didn't do your million bucks, well, you have to take responsibility for it. So the biggest thing I see with people and goals is they don't put timelines on it, and therefore they're just destined to fail because there's no point in time where they're forced to hold themselves accountable. So make sure you put timelines on your goals because then you have to hold yourself accountable and at least admit yes or no. You either succeeded or you failed, okay? And this is one of the most important things about being successful and uh, actually accomplishing the, your dreams is setting actionable goals that have timelines. So write out your plan, put timelines on it, figure out what you want to accomplish, and then follow it and reassess at those milestones. I highly recommend that you're setting daily goals, weekly goals, monthly goals, quarterly goals, and annual goals, all at the same time, so that you're constantly working towards them and reassessing and holding yourself accountable. That's gonna make you grow as a person, and that's really gonna help you build a business, and most affiliates are not doing this shit. 
All right, so if you're gonna get started, you're gonna need to establish a testing budget, all right? And the most important thing I want you to get out of this, this lesson is you're probably gonna lose money, you should get comfortable with losing money, and you should assume you're going to lose money, okay? And so let's run through these approximate minimum budgets right now, all right? So if you're gonna be a broker and you're gonna broker calls from one company to another, theoretically, if you can develop a relationship with them and get someone to issue you credit, you can start with zero dollars, effectively, all right? And that's assuming that uh, you have a couple bucks to license some software like Ringba to facilitate that brokering, okay? So it's not actually zero, but it's essentially zero. Now, if you're gonna be a, an affiliate, there are a few ways that you can creatively generate call traffic. I'm not gonna mention them in this video, but if you can find places to post or where people congregate, or you can like manually hit people up, you can generate call traffic without any money, though it's very hard to do and it's typically not scalable, all right? It is possible, but it's not usually scalable. Now, if you're gonna start online and you're gonna use Google AdWords or Facebook, you're gonna need about 500 bucks, all right? And that's the absolute bare minimum if you have some type of background in these spaces. If you don't know anything about pay per call and you only have $50 to try and figure it out, you're gonna have a real fucking hard time doing that, all right? So save your money and then try harder, okay? But I mean, realistically, with 500 bucks, you probably can test one traffic source. It probably should be Google AdWords, and you're gonna need to move really, really slowly, okay? Now, if you're gonna actually buy media and get really good at it, you have to realize that your time becomes more valuable than the money. And so, uh, for instance, if I were gonna test a campaign on Google or Facebook, my minimum budget would be like $1,000 for a single campaign. I would probably create 100 different ads and I would try and burn that money as fast as possible to see what users are reacting to, and then I would throw another $1,000 at a completely different set of ad sets, and then another $1,000, and another $1,000. And so for me to really learn a campaign, I'm probably gonna light $3,000 on fire, I'm gonna spend $5,000 optimizing, maybe I'm profitable at that point, you know, I'm realistically going to throw $10,000 at a campaign. That, that doesn't mean you can't do it for less. I just want to be clear, but I'm going to do it really fast. And so that's the kind of money you need to throw around if you want to, like, build out, develop, and run a new campaign at volume uh, in a few days, okay? Like, yeah, I'm going to spend it in a couple days, especially on social. If I'm gonna go do Facebook ads, I'm gonna try and spend $10,000 in my first day. I wanna find the win as soon as possible. Doesn't mean you can't do it for less. You can absolutely be patient and spend less money and build your campaign slowly, but if you wanna go quick and build campaigns, you need a bankroll to do it. And so that's why it's really important to save your money. Now, assuming you're gonna go test some out-of-home advertising, you're gonna need about 2,500 bucks to do that, and you're probably gonna light a good portion of that on fire to get started. So realistically, you don't wanna go test out-of-home uh, unless you have $2,500 that you're willing to flush down the toilet. Now, keep in mind that when I say burn or flush down the toilet, that doesn't mean you're not gonna get any revenue back on it, and it doesn't mean you're not gonna learn something that uh, changes your business, okay? That's why I'm so willing to spend the money on media to figure it out because I'll learn something that will change my business. I'll probably make some of that money back and so will you, but you should assume that you're just gonna lose all of it, right? Assume that you're just gonna lose all of it because then you can make financial decisions you can live with. You should not take your life savings and plow it into buying traffic so that tomorrow you have no money and you're screwed. You should have set your risk tolerance in accordance with your capital, okay? And so if you're an affiliate coming over to pay per call from another vertical, uh, you're gonna have more capital, you're gonna understand how this works, uh, and you're gonna understand that you're gonna lose some money. If you're brand new to this, 
and you need to figure it out, you probably want to start slower and not move into these more complicated mediums like out of home, print, radio, and television because you're just going to lose a bunch of money um, and you may or may not learn something from it because you're not sophisticated enough to do so yet, okay? So if you're new, stick to brokering, being an affiliate, buying traffic, buying media, and until you get bigger, you want to stay out of these other spaces. You know, the first time I ran a television ad, I ended up losing 100% of my investment. So <laughs> it was just an abysmal, absolute failure. It was hilarious, it was a lot of fun, uh, and we, we went on at that point, this was many years ago, to build a successful TV commercial, but um, the first one we put out there was just a failure, and you should expect that, right? Now, with print, you can go in lower because you can just buy classified ads or smaller ads. It may not be enough at those really low prices to get you any real results or understanding of how to scale it, but you can absolutely do that at a smaller scale. So if you've bought print media before, you've worked with newspapers before, you could actually start there. I just recommend at least $1,000 because you're gonna have to figure it out. And it's not gonna go very quick. Like out of home print, radio and television aren't gonna go very quick because you have to negotiate, get insertion orders, create your materials, all that good stuff to actually move a campaign forward. Now. How do you determine how much money you're actually gonna need? So you need to understand what your target cost per caller is. And so if your campaign pays out $25, your target cost per caller should probably be $15, right? And I'm just pulling this out of thin air. That would give you a healthy margin and a healthy amount of money to buy clicks, right? Somewhere in the middle, okay? And so the easiest way to do this is to review campaign payouts with the networks, negotiate always, and then multiply whatever payout you're getting by 3x to get an online potential spend per source, okay? And so if you start an AdWords campaign and you're being paid $10 and you buy $30 worth of clicks and you get zero phone calls, you're doing something wrong, okay? So 300% of your payout should be the upper bounds of the limit of, for you to learn something. Now, if you spend $30 and you get one phone call, that means you need to go optimize, right? But if you spend $30 and get zero, something is wrong or you're approaching it the entirely wrong way. And so this is just a simple rule of thumb, right? If your payout's 100 bucks and you spend $300 and you get nothing, you're, you're really in a wrong spot. But the thing is, you need to spend more than your CPA or your payout to figure out if it's gonna work. Because if your payout's $10, you spend $10 and get zero, well, if you spent $14, you might've gotten three phone calls, okay? And that's kind of how advertising works. It's funny like that. Um, conversions can come in waves. It's, it's a, a large scale uh, statistical model that you're working with. And so when you're working with micro budgets, your results aren't gonna be typical. Now, the more money you spend, the more likely that your results will be typical on a campaign because you have more statistical data to gather statistical significance, all right? Now, you need to decide what traffic sources you're going to work with. The easiest way to do that is to research other people's campaigns, do a little spy work, Google around, search on Facebook, for companies in the industries you wanna work in and click info and ads on their Facebook page. Uh, Facebook and Google have essentially made their entire platform an ad spy. You just go search around for what you wanna promote and the answers of how to do it are given to you, okay? It's not rocket science, you can go look. You're gonna then research your keyword cost per click or your social cost per click, your cost per click in general so that you understand how much it's gonna cost you per click, all right? Now, if it's $80 a click and your payout's 30 bucks, you should not run that campaign. But if your payout's $10 and it seems like clicks are going for 50 cents to two bucks, well, you probably can figure out how to make that work, okay? So it's all just simple math, and if you do your research up front, it's not that complicated. Create a Google AdWords account, go to your keyword planner, and then start Googling keywords that are relevant 
to the offers you want to run and then when you see an ad that looks like a paper call ad on your phone type that keyword into the keyword planner and then you will see the average price for that keyword and then you can go okay well if my conversion rate to a call is 60 percent or 70 percent and you know 50 percent of people stay on the phone more than the minute and 30 seconds you can reverse engineer the math to see if you have a fair shot of actually creating a campaign so talk to your account managers and find at networks or your buyers and find out what percentage of calls from that specific traffic source actually convert into a payout event and if it's Google, they're going to have this data for you because Google is the largest source of traffic for everything. And so the likelihood that they have an affiliate already running this campaign on Google is high. And so they can give you some of the math you need or some of the information you need to do the math so that you can do your campaign research. All right. So now we need to choose our first campaign. How exactly do we do that? Well, first and foremost, you need to find out what's available, what has capacity, and what's popular, all right? Easiest way to do that is to make sure that you're in all the paper call groups, the LinkedIn, Facebook, Skype groups, that you're on the forums, etc. And then you figure out what people are buying, what they have a need for. Now, if someone has a need for something, they're gonna be more likely to work with you than trying to figure out a way to add a few more calls to their potential available capacity, okay? You also need to figure out what offers are the highest volume. Now, if there's a micro niche somewhere, like, I don't know, uh, porch slab installation in Pittsburgh, all right? That might be a great campaign because there's no competition but there's no volume either, so that you're not gonna have uh, an easy time really building that campaign because there's no one to look at, okay? There's no one to get your competitive intelligence from. And so that's why I would take a look at the highest volume offers because they're gonna be the easiest to find running out there, the easiest to understand, all right? You may not actually wanna run the highest volume offers. You may wanna find some mid-level offers that have plenty of capacity but aren't as saturated but you wanna absolutely understand what the highest volume offers are so that you know where the biggest volume of potential revenue is, okay? And so I know people that are doing $100 a day, $1,000 a day, $10,000 a day, $100,000 a day in paper call on a single offer, okay? We have clients that are doing all of those. And so I know for a fact that paper call volume can be huge. It's just a matter of figuring out where the volume is and then creating competitive advantage in that space. So I suggest that you start wherever you have a background or at least an understanding. Because if you have an understanding, you can create intent of callers, you can create campaigns around it, you know how the buyers build their business, so that you can find direct buyers and have a conversation with them, okay? So if you used to be an insurance sales guy and now you're into online marketing, guess what? Insurance is your shit, homie, right? If you used to install toilets, plumbing campaigns, right? I don't care what your background is, no judgment, okay? What matters is what you know, and you wanna do what you know already so that you can speak the language and you can figure out opportunities. Now, if you don't know anything about insurance, except that it's a massive industry, your learning curve is a lot steeper. And so if you have no money and no industry knowledge, well, that's not necessarily a great place to start, all right? And you should also know what your caller demographics are, what the intent of that person is, are they trying to get a lower rate or is their sink flooding uh, and their house is sinking, right? You need to understand what the customers want and then you need to understand uh, the geographic area of these campaigns, right? Is it the Pittsburgh slab installation or is it a nationwide insurance campaign? Is it only regional coverage or whatever? Is it international? Can you take it all over the world, right? 
So you need to understand what areas you're gonna target and what areas this works in so that you know whether you have an understanding of the campaign or not. Is it gonna be scalable? Are you gonna to have to learn another campaign and manage multiple? You need to do your research and know your shit. So the most successful people in pay per call, I can list them, right? And at the top of that list are the people that know their shit front and back better than anybody else, okay? And those are the people that are frankly getting rich doing this, all right? And the people who don't know all the information, their money comes in at a rate proportional to how much they know and how hard they work. All right, don't let anyone tell you any different. This isn't some laptop lifestyle nonsense. All right, success in paper call is directly proportional to who you know, how much you know, and how hard you work. Sky's the limit, okay? You can make a ton of money in this space, no doubt. All right, but you can only do it if you're gonna work at it and you're willing to learn. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do now that we've talked about those things is become an affiliate, all right? We've picked our verticals. Now we gotta go out and find our first network, okay? And we gotta get them to accept us. This isn't necessarily the easiest thing in the world, all right? I talk about this uh, in some other lessons, but you need to be transparent. You need to be willing to show them your landing pages. You need to be willing to show them who you are. You need to create an online presence. You need to use your real name. I don't care if you're foreign or not. All right, if you're foreign, it's even more important to be honest, okay? And then you need to apply to these networks. You need to find the people on LinkedIn. You need to start conversations, meet them at trade shows, whatever you gotta do to create a relationship, all right? And it's not gonna be as simple as just applying and then expecting that they're gonna work with you, all right? So know up front that you're gonna have to do work, all right? Pay per call is exclusionary not inclusionary. And the reason for that is compliance is far more complicated. So it's much more important for them to go for quality, not quantity. So if you're new, a lot of networks will work with you. A lot of them won't. Don't be offended, but you're going to have to put some work in to actually get accepted. Now, I would test three to five offers based on account manager feedback. All right. I'm gonna to try to get accepted to a few uh, networks at the same time, okay? Because if I find a campaign that works, I'm gonna immediately wanna start load balancing my traffic to figure out the backend conversion rates to see how much money I'm actually getting. Just because a network pays you more money per call that converts doesn't necessarily mean you will make more money per call, okay? So you need multiple networks to load balance against to figure out who the best is and who has the best vibes. Now, if you use Ringba, we'll show you the ones that have all the technology problems, errors, and capacity issues. Our competitors don't really do that, okay? And so we try to illuminate where the problems are so that you can figure out how to make more money. I highly recommend you work with us, all right? And so once I've talked to the account managers and they give me three to five, off three to five offers, I'm going to focus on a specific traffic type, right? So in this example, I'm gonna see if they have AdWords call only landers for me, all right? Those are ones that I can use. I don't actually have to create my own landers. I can just focus on generating uh, the calls. And you wanna ask them if they have these things also so you can see them. I'm not gonna out anybody's campaigns, but they're out there. And if you talk to the networks, you'll find out who has them. And then once you see them, you can create your own. If you need your own landing pages, hit up Ringba. We have tons of them. We, get a, we give them away for free, both advertorial style for uh, social marketing and uh, click to call pages for like search type marketing and verification pages for Google. So just talk to Ringba about it. Networks don't really do that. They don't have landing page packs they give out, but we do and you can have them. You can use them with whatever networks you want. Modify them, we don't care, okay? No strings attached. All right, if you have to make your own from scratch, get feedback, show it to the groups, ask them for feedback. People will give you feedback, okay? And then you can go make your stuff better, all right? Run your ad copy by other marketers too. I hate to break it to you, but if you're brand new and you're getting into marketing and you write yourself an ad, it's not some sort of top secret information, okay? If I wanna write an ad that competes against you, I can. Whether you show me yours or not, I know what I'm doing, okay? So it doesn't matter. You're not outing anything by showing your first couple ads to people 
All right, get feedback from professional marketers. I, I can't express this enough. Most people that go into our groups and talk, they're like, I can't make paper call work, what do I do? No one responds to them, because those people suck. They're not actually trying. If you take your ads and expose them to the community though and say, hey guys, how can I improve this? New people are gonna see what you're doing, you can inspire them, and veterans will help you. If you put your ad in those Skype groups and I see it, I will personally give you feedback. So will our team, so will a bunch of networks, so will so many other people, okay? All right, you just have to be open about it. And then you're gonna change it anyways based on their feedback. And so those aren't gonna be the ads you run anyways. You're not actually exposing what you're doing, all right? Ask people for help, tips and suggestions, but show them the material and give them the information that actually allows them to give you feedback, right? I'm not making any money, but I'm not gonna tell you what I'm doing doesn't really give me a lot of clay to mold, right? But if you're like, hey Adam, let me show you my Facebook campaign, my landing pages, and my statistics, I'm like, well hot damn, let's build a campaign together. And this is true, okay? If you talk to some Ringba clients, they'll tell you exactly that. I hit up Adam, I showed him my Facebook ads, I showed him my landing page, I walked him through my flow, he took a look at my Ringba account, and then bam, I got like five different actionable items I can change that'll increase my conversion rate. Happy to do it, but very few people are happy to show what they're working on uh, so that we can actually give advice, all right? So just don't be so uptight about it, it's ridiculous. Test small and see if you can generate calls. If my budget's restricted, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna test, 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 test until I generate a phone call. Maybe I take all three, three to five offers at four different networks and I throw $15 per campaign per network to see if I can get some calls generated, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna start with single keyword group ad campaigns and we cover this in another lesson so that I can understand what consumer intent is. Now me personally, like I said, I love to work. It's fascinating to me. Like this is the most amusing thing I could possibly do is create advertisements for me. So I'm gonna create hundreds or thousands of combinations. You better believe if I'm running a social campaign that I'm testing like thousands of combinations to figure out what works, all right? And that's usually the difference between a successful affiliate and someone who fails is their willingness to test. A lot of affiliates are like, well, I created two ads and I got eight keywords and I used someone else's landing page and I'm not really making any money. What am I doing wrong? I'm like, well, first and foremost, you're lazy, okay? You should have tested 300 advertisements, 400 keywords, and five different landers, right? You need to optimize everything, and it's all about testing, 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 all right? And I picked this chart because it shows what it's like, right? Small win, 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 lose, win, bigger loss, win, 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 right? You're gonna, it's a roller coaster ride. You should expect to test a lot of things and to lose. 300% of your payout is effectively your minimum budget per campaign uh, or per keyword. You just have to accept that, okay? If you can't get to 300% of the payout, you're probably not gonna succeed. Now divide your budget among multiple offers and traffic sources like we talked about to reduce your risk. If you got a $1,000 budget, I'm gonna be running that in 20 $50 blocks so that I have a lot of chances to get some traction and then I'm gonna reinvest whatever I make into more testing. When you're new and you just get started, listen to 100% of your calls as an affiliate without exception. Just have them playing in the background. Because you are gonna see that people are calling and they're like, hey, uh, how do I apply for this job? And you're like, job? This is a medical device campaign. And they're like, ah, oh, crap, I need to go rethink my negative keywords or I need to rethink my advertising campaign. So you need to listen to your calls to understand consumer intent so that you can modify your marketing to get quality up, right? Because if you got 40 calls calling about employment to a call center for a campaign that's about medical devices, the call center's gonna bitch, the network's gonna shut you down, you're not gonna make any money, right? So just listen to your calls. And then as your business expands and you start finding wins, hire a virtual assistant, maybe hire some media buyers and start building a team around what you're doing so that you can expand your business. Now, once we have active campaigns that are running and stable and we're generating calls, 
maybe 30 calls a day, 50, 100 calls a day, more, right? I'm gonna immediately spend my time expanding relationships and load balancing my calls. Immediately, right? I'm gonna wanna be working with every single buyer and every single network humanly possible to find out who's brokering what to who, cut people out of the equation, and add more buyers into my routing plan so I can see which buyers make me the most money and to expand my capacity, all right? And so what you'll learn very quickly is a lot of offers are brokered in the pay per call space and you can navigate your way through to the direct buyer and the exclusive relationship and get your payouts up, okay? And so direct buyers would rather work with direct affiliates than networks, 100% of the time. So as a direct affiliate, you have a competitive advantage because networks have a bunch of affiliates and have the ability to blend shitty traffic with good traffic to the same buyer and not expose which publisher's sending which. And so being a direct affiliate, you can go direct to the buyer, they have more control over it, and they're much happier to work with a direct affiliate than a network. So you, by nature of how the business works, as an affiliate, have a competitive advantage. If you can get direct to the buyer, and you have a history in that campaign of delivering quality calls, you have recording examples you can show them, you have quality assurance checklists you can show them, they're gonna be happy to work with you, okay? So search the groups, forums, websites, everywhere. Find networks with complimentary offers. Apply and negotiate the hell out of those campaigns. And then add them to your load balancing routing plans, okay? You're gonna use duplicate call routing and Ringba to make more money. If you sold a call to a network and it paid you, or maybe even not, depending on how they have it configured, and that call goes back to the same network, you don't get paid twice, or maybe even once, okay? But if you use Ringba, you can route all your duplicate calls to different networks and get paid twice for the same caller, right? Get it, okay? And this is why load balancing your own tracking platform is so important. It's a profit center for you. It's not overhead, it's a profit center, okay? A lot of our clients on duplicate call routing alone turn a profit and pay for Ringba, all right? And so you need this to grow your business. You're gonna review your results, compare conversion rates across networks, not just payout, okay? Payout does not necessarily mean you make more money. And then you're gonna use that information to negotiate more, and then you're gonna negotiate some more. You're gonna watch my lesson on negotiation, and then you're gonna go negotiate some more, and then you just keep negotiating. You never stop negotiating in this business, or people will eat your margins up. All right, and then you also need to, again, listen to all your calls. This time though, as you understand that your calls are quality and that you've weeded all the nonsense out of them, you're listening for buyer behavior so that you can optimize the other side of your business. You have to do both. You gotta optimize the callers and the buyers. Most affiliates in this space aren't worried about optimizing the quality of their calls or their buyers, they're just trying to make a quick buck. And that is not an effective way to do this. You wanna learn everything you can so you can optimize both sides. And that's how you build a real and big business in this space. You gotta do the work. So after I have load balanced all these calls and I'm working with multiple networks and I started working with direct buyers, I'm gonna create my own contracts and IOs all right, I'm gonna make sure that all the information I need is in those IOs to protect myself. And we talk about that in some other lessons. We got some examples for you, okay? But you want your own, you want them branded, and you want them professional so that buyers take you seriously and they understand that you're on top of your shit. If you show up to a direct buyer and you're like, well, I don't have a contract, I'm just an affiliate, blah, blah, blah. You don't look good, okay? You wanna to go to the direct buyer and say, you wanna work with me, Here's my contract, I'm on top of my shit, here's how we do quality assurance, here's how we're running our business, I know I'm young, or I know we only have a couple employees here, but we're really motivated to be good at what we do and grow a business. And so people will appreciate that, they'll take you seriously, and they'll more often than not be willing to work with you even if you're small, even if you're a solo affiliate, okay? Create a pitch PowerPoint for call centers, what I would do is I would create a pitch PowerPoint for call centers that are doing outbound 
on why inbound is so much better and pay per call should be the future of their business. And then once you show them the power of pay per call, you got yourself a direct buyer and a long term relationship. Okay. And so I would be finding direct call center buyers as soon as humanly possible so that I can get my margins up and scale my business. I'm going to seek them out on forums. I'm going to seek them out in groups, at trade shows. I'm going to cold call call centers, right? I'm even going to search the campaigns I'm working on, pick up the phone and call the ads from my competitors and get the call centers on the phone and then tell them I need to speak to their marketing department, right? I'm gonna do that cold call myself. I'm gonna try and navigate my way through their sales funnel so that I can sell them calls. Maybe I'm gonna make friends with the rep, level with them, be like, hey, I know you make commission. I apologize for taking up your time, but we have really high quality phone calls and I'd like to sell them to your call center and hopefully that makes you more money. Can you put me in contact with your marketing people? I'm very serious about this, right? And so, and if they, if they hang up on me, I'm gonna call them back again. I'm gonna keep calling until I get to their marketing department so that I can establish these direct relationships. Then I'm gonna actually visit the call centers. Yes, in-person visits. I'm gonna get on a plane or get in the car, whatever I gotta do. If you can't afford uh, a plane ticket and you need the direct buyer, it'll like double your revenue. I'm gonna get in my car, drive nine hours, I'll sleep in the fucking car, I don't care, right? I'm gonna show up, I'm gonna be dressed professionally, and I'm gonna negotiate myself a deal. I'm gonna build that relationship so I can grow my business, okay? Showing up is sometimes half the battle. And then once I have a bunch of direct relationships, once I've turned this into a process, I'm gonna hire advertiser business development people to handle and manage this for me. But all my most important relationships, I'm gonna make sure I'm communicating with on at least a somewhat regular basis to protect the future of my business. Now, once I have my own traffic and I'm load balancing my calls to a bunch of networks and direct buyers and I'm building my business, I'm gonna build my own self-serve micro buyer network. And that effectively means that I'm gonna find people in my industry that want my phone calls that are the actual end user of them, right? And so if I'm selling calls to a center that's then warm transferring those calls to the direct buyer, okay, I'm effectively going around them and creating my own direct buyer network. And this is how you get the most money per call period, right? You find the insurance office, uh, the Allstate representative that has three salespeople and wants phone calls, right? You hire them. They're licensed to buy the calls and sell the insurance and if they had more phone calls, they could probably hire more reps. It's a lot more work to do it this way, but once you got them, your margins are way higher, and that means you can outbid everybody for the traffic, and when you can outbid everybody for the traffic, then you're fucking Kim Jong click, right? No one can compete with you, and that should be what your end goal is, okay? And so I'm gonna start with a few of them. I'm gonna figure out this game myself. We do a whole lesson on this. And then I'm gonna add them into my routing plan. Maybe I'm only selling them a couple calls a day. That doesn't mean I shouldn't do it. That just means I need to increase my coverage. I'm gonna use the networks and brokers and my direct big call center buyers and transfer uh, call center buyers to handle all my overflow from the direct buyer network as I build it. And so I'm essentially just slowly rising, okay, by building these networks of call buyers uh, in a repeatable process, right? So I'm gonna create that repeatable process and then I'm gonna hire business development people or even a call center that I have a relationship with to do this for me and to onboard people so that I can get much more money out of these phone calls, okay? And then after that or concurrently while I'm doing that, I'm gonna start creating individual sites for each vertical that I'm in. I'm only gonna use dot coms because I don't care who tells you otherwise, dot coms are the only domain names that matter. I'm not gonna use hyphens, because those are dumb and people can't remember them. I'm not gonna use puns, and I'm not gonna use numbers in the name of my brand, because it doesn't work, people don't remember them, okay? And so, I always use bustaname.com. It's how we found Ringba. Ringba.com was actually available for $9, okay? And so, you can find some awesome domain names by using combination of words and just again, putting in a bunch of work to do it, okay? 
Then I'm gonna create some great content for those brands and those verticals. I'm gonna find writers. I'm gonna outsource this process. I'm gonna create a social media following. I'm gonna create a real brand. And then I'm gonna invest in link building and SEO, okay? And then I'm gonna drive traffic to landing pages for my campaigns on these domains to further penetrate the market with these brands so people can use them, okay? I'm also gonna buy drop domains and convert them into blogs. I'm gonna look at archive.org to recreate the content on drop domains. And I'm gonna create a network of websites in a space so that I can dominate search results and mind share in that space and funnel traffic up to my own uh, brands, right? And then when I have my own brand, then I can do my TV, my radio, my out of home, my print, I can start to dominate geographic areas, right? And build something that has enterprise value. Furthermore, I'm gonna start, once I have some money, right? Assuming I start from scratch, I'm gonna start looking at Flippa and I'm gonna start cold calling blogs and other sites that get a bunch of traffic that need polish and that I can acquire. So you can acquire sites, fold them into your uh, business model, use them to generate call traffic that's super high quality to your direct buyers. And now we're vertically integrated. Now we own the whole path, the traffic, the buyer network. Now we can get acquired for some serious money uh, and then retire, live on a yacht, do whatever you're gonna do. In my case, I would maybe sell it and then do it again, because I don't know what else I would do with my time, and this is what I love to do. So you need to figure out what's right for you, but this is uh, essentially the end game shit. Okay, and so once you have your own brand, maybe you're building blogs, you got your buyer network, and you're expanding on everything in here the whole time, you're gonna start transitioning to new traffic sources. This may happen earlier in your progression or later. It all depends on the capacity you have and the type of success you're seeing. If it's working on Google, it's probably gonna work on Bing. And if it's working on Google, you can probably make it work with domain and pop contextual traffic, okay? People are like, pop-ups for calls? Adam, you're crazy. That doesn't work. Well, people tell me all the time that pops don't work on things, social doesn't work on things, alternative mediums don't work, all right? That just means they haven't figured it out yet. That doesn't mean it doesn't work, okay? So if you have a giant list of keywords that work in search, well, guess what? You can take that list of keywords and pop it into contextual traffic sources and then most likely make the campaigns work by modifying your landing page. This is how you do it, okay? You're gonna fail at first. A lot of people are gonna say shit doesn't work. Well, they're the ones that aren't making any money with it, okay? All right? I already know all this stuff works for pay per call. Most people just haven't figured it out yet. If you're gonna do Facebook, great. Then you move to Instagram, Snap, convert your native campaigns over, find more complementary traffic sources, right? If it's working on social, it's gonna work on intent-based marketing like native, okay? And then if you're targeting a heavy geographic region or you have regional campaigns, you hit them on radio, TV, out of home, print, okay, and drive more traffic into your brand. So you just expand, 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 expand. Then, once you understand all of the metrics, you have all of the buyers, you know all of the numbers, you can bring on your own affiliates to scale your own business. Now, this may work for you, it may not. This is an entirely different way of going about things, but it doesn't mean you can't do it, it just requires learning, okay? And so, you create a list of your offers, Whatever you built, whatever buyer networks you have, okay, and your offers are effectively your business development assets that you've converted into a routing plan, and you post those in groups on forums, you promote them on content sites, you tell people you need more phone calls and insurance and what, or whatever you're doing, okay? You hire some affiliate managers, you hire a quality assurance team so that you can stay on top of your affiliates, and you implement an accounting and billing solution right? So that you can pay these people. There's a bunch of them out there. It's not complicated. And then you always start slow with new affiliates to prevent issues. All right. We have a whole lesson on working with affiliates, but as your business grows, you don't have to do it all yourself. You can build a team around it. And if you've used Ringba to create your own network of buyers through load balancing calls, you now have your own offer. And this is why networks typically will tell you, oh, you don't need your own tracking because then you can build your own offers and build your own business, okay? 
And so you need to free yourself from that mindset and use the tools that were built so you can make money. That's why we're doing this. And then if you decide you want to, once you have your own buyers and your own affiliates for specific campaigns, you can start your own network business and broker campaigns too. Now, I would not do this, okay? I don't like the network business model. I like to add value, so me personally, I don't recommend it, okay? If you don't have your own competitive advantage, it's hard to run a network. You're essentially a bank, okay? And it's lots of spinning plates. It's just like being an affiliate on crack, all right? And so if you're gonna start a network, you, you really need to think this through, all right? I highly recommend calling it an agency instead of a network. An affiliate network has a negative connotation to it. So does a paper call network in most cases to a brand. Network just says, I broker shit. Okay, and so big brands don't really like that, all right? It's not the network's fault, uh, it's just the ecosystem at time of filming, okay? And so if you're gonna open it, call it an agency, all right? And that simple thing's gonna help you out. Treat it more like an agency and brand, uh, branded companies, companies that invest in their brand will feel more comfortable working with you. And then, since you started as an affiliate and you have your own media buying division, you have an internal traffic narrative, okay? And so, a lot of brands and a lot of big buyers do not want to work with people who only have affiliate traffic. They want to see that you have your own traffic because then you control everything and there's no bullshit, all right? And then they know at least you understand how to generate the calls, the intent of the consumer, how the back end of the campaign works, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, if you're going to do this, you should exhibit at trade shows. A lot of paper call networks exhibit at one or two trade shows. I don't understand this. There's a couple networks that exhibit at like all of them and they're growing rapidly and kudos to them because exhibiting at a trade show is important. You got to work it. It's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of costs to it, frankly, but you can build a whole business off of it. We do it. We spend a ton of money at trade shows every year for Ringba, but it's really important to our growth, okay? Now, you should also sponsor events. I don't know why more networks do this. Maybe they don't see it. It's harder to track the ROI. But if you want to show yourself as a pillar of the community, you should sponsor events. It shows goodwill. People know who you are. When people know who you are, they're willing to take your phone call, okay? They're willing to at least talk to you. It gives you the opportunity, all right? Then you want to build an affiliate audience. How do you do that? You teach people how to run campaigns and start a business in the space, right? I'm eating my own dog food here, but it's true, right? And then you leverage your own hard work into growth. If you're gonna do a network, you need to focus a ton of time on QA. I don't think a single network puts in enough work on QA anywhere. And I think that's a detriment to their business. It's not overhead, it's a profit center when done correctly, all right? And lastly, I'm gonna, this is the most important part, be careful with payment terms. If you pay too quickly, you will get frauded and you will be holding the bag, all right? So pay new affiliates slowly, make sure you get paid before you pay people, right? Make sure your payment terms are in line with the amount of capital you have to lose. And I'm not gonna run you through a whole lesson on this, maybe we'll do it at another date, but um, I highly recommend you focus on the rest of this lesson instead of starting a network business, I think, being a broker isn't the best use of your time, and it's also not how you sell your business for a really nice multiple.